At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, surely he is a god. Either he is meditating, or has wandered away, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Is it just me, or does Elijah seem like a bit of a jerk? <laughs> to mock another person for his or her religion just ain't right. Particularly in this day and age, when we live as part of a multi-faith society and a global community. Biblical passages like this one make me uncomfortable and indignant. After all, we Christians are quick to quote the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers and all that, which is hard to do with integrity when we claim passages like this one from the first book of Kings. Instead of building bridges across religious divides, Elijah is throwing down the gauntlet and calling his opponents out with playground taunts like, my God can beat up your God. <laughs> of course, this isn't so foreign to us given the last several months of political campaigning, which has featured proposals to deny Muslims entry into this country for no other reason than that they are Muslim. Religious dimensions to political rhetoric is not a new phenomenon as Elijah shows us. And that should give us pause as we consider what kind of Christians and what kind of citizens we are becoming. But it's important first to recognize what undergirds Elijah's religious extremism, for that's what it is. This passage, like much of the Hebrew Bible, is preoccupied with the survival of the Israelites as a distinct nation and people. The tensions and stakes are high because it was believed that if the Israelites married foreign women, they would be tempted to worship their wives' gods rather than Yahweh, the God of Israel. Israelite identity was so bound up with the covenant with Yahweh that if the people were lured to worship Baal, it would spell the extinction of the Israelites from the face of the earth. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah, on which I have preached before, for example, are focused on the Israelites' survival through right worship and ethnic purity. So the purpose of Elijah's denigration of the cult of Baal is to discredit it, to take away its allure. If the worship of Baal is exposed to be nothing but smoke and mirrors, lacking any real substance, then it will cease to be a threat and the Israelites will be preserved and continue into the next generation. The Canaanite religion must be proved to be false. And this is what happens. The lectionary that we use, however, doesn't allow us to hear how the story really ends. The lectionary, you'll recall, is the book of all the readings selected for worship in the church on Sundays and feasts. The passage concludes prematurely with Yahweh's stunning victory over Baal. Yahweh dramatically sets the waterlogged altar on fire, whereas Baal remains silent and absent. And the people rejoice, the Lord indeed is God, the Lord indeed is God. One of my long-standing criticisms of the lectionary, and I know there are some out there who agree with me, is that it often omits verses that problematize the scripture. We are sheltered from verses that might make us uncomfortable. These verses are either too violent or mean-spirited or theologically icky in some way, and the compilers of the lectionary excised them so that we wouldn't have to deal with them. But deal with them we must and we will. This story actually ends with Elijah declaring, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. Then they seize them and Elijah brought them down to the Wadi Kishon and killed them there. Quite a different ending, wouldn't you agree? Now, neither Elijah nor the Israelites generally had a monopoly on religiously motivated violence. Many ancient Near Eastern civilizations sought religious hegemony over their neighbors through violence and forced conversion. Many Christians blush to remember the Crusades, the Inquisition, and more recently, Fred Phelps. History should therefore make us very cautious about using incidents of religious extremism 
as a way to stigmatize an entire religion or people. Even our reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians makes me a little uneasy because it demonstrates how easy it would be to take the apostles' warning against false gospels too far by denigrating those with a different belief system. As we have said before, so now I repeat, Paul declares, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that one be accursed. That's strong language. It doesn't take too much imagination to transform Paul's injunction into death to the heathen. I'm not suggesting that this is what Paul was urging. But it's scary, isn't it? How easily we can distort one message into another. Paul was legitimately concerned, as any pastor is, about people who were distorting the teachings of Jesus and leading the faithful astray. The apostle to the Gentiles was trying to ensure the accurate transmission and application of the gospel as he received it in a new mission field that was cluttered with a wide range of spiritual paths and philosophical outlooks that contradicted the tenets of the Jesus movement. The world in which Paul evangelized was just about as diverse and multi-faith an environment as the world in which we live today. And thus we have a lot in common. So the question is, how do we preserve the distinctiveness of our own faith identity, while at the same time avoid the temptation to see those of other faiths as a threat, to degenerate into an us and them dynamic? The gospel, not too surprisingly, is helpful in answering this question. In our reading from the gospel according to Luke, God's healing power disregards the societal distinctions that divided people from each other in the ancient world. The centurion, a Roman citizen who was most likely a follower of the imperial religion, shows loving concern for his slave, a social inferior. He is also supportive of the local Jewish population who speak up for him, attesting to his worthiness and love of them, which included his building of the local synagogue. This generosity, notwithstanding Jesus was a Jew who would have been under no religious obligation to the Roman soldier or to his slave. As a member of the conquered population, moreover, Jesus would have been regarded as the centurion's inferior. And yet this icon of the imperial authority approaches Jesus in humility, acknowledging Jesus' lordship over him. Lord, do not trouble yourself, he says meekly, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but speak the word and let my servant be healed. Jesus' amazement is understandable, not only because the centurion addresses him as a superior, as Lord, but also because of his great faith and concern for his subordinate. The first will be last, and the last will be first indeed. Glue's gospel offers us a vision of what it looks like for otherness to be received without stigma and violence. When conqueror and conquered, Jew and pagan, free and slave care for each other, advocate for each other, God's love and healing are present. The passage is characterized by deep conversation across social, religious, ethnic, cultural, political, and other divides that not only conveys factual information, but also mutual understanding and commitment. No one is seen as a threat. No one is in it for him or herself, but for each other, for the community. Action then follows speech, healing follows conversation, and everyone is transformed. The very man who could have perpetrated violence, the centurion, an imperial soldier with might on his side takes the path of peace and humility. What a sobering vision for all of us in this climate of frequent religious and political extremism. The best way to preserve our faith is to apply it indiscriminately to all by viewing every human being as our sister and brother. For as Paul declares elsewhere to the Galatians, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. 
In the name of the one, holy, and undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.